Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for your patience. Good afternoon, and welcome to our monthly telehealth conference. Uh, today is August 8th. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for being here today uh, in Spokane and also at the many communities, uh, the 15 sites that are joining us today. So um, thank you, everybody, for, for spending time with us this afternoon. On behalf of uh, Northwest Parkinson's, our partner in Seattle, and the Parkinson's Resource Center of Spokane, I'd like to welcome everybody. And of course, as always, I'd like to thank our sponsors for helping us bring this uh, outstanding program uh, to all the communities today. Um, our partners in Seattle, Northwest uh, Telehealth, for producing today's program, or partners here, rather, um, and St. Luke's Rehab for hosting today's uh, program. Northwest Parkinson's out of Seattle, uh, Albertsons certainly for their ongoing generosity, and all our friends and volunteers and board members at the Parkinson's Resource Center of Spokane. And lastly but not least, our volunteers and certainly all of you out in our outlying communities uh, for making this happen. As always, uh, we'll, let's hold questions till the end, and I would ask that all the remote sites, if you would turn off your mics uh, until we get to the question and answer period, and I thank you in advance for doing that. And so please do uh, mute those microphones. Uh, something different today, and I'll do this at the end during the Q&A, uh, we'd like to get a better idea of how many are in attendance at each site. So when I do the roll call at the end for questions, I'm going to ask you how many of you are in attendance today. So if you'd please be ready to provide that to me, uh, whether or not you have a question uh, or not, uh, that would be uh, most helpful. So thank you very much. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our special guest today. Dr. Lynn Kohlmeyer is a practicing physician uh, in Spokane at Sacred Heart Medical Center and Spokane Osteoporosis. Uh, Dr. Kohlmeyer was educated in numerous places. Uh, she uh, has her undergrad from Yale University, or her medical school degree at Stanford University on the West Coast here her internal medicine residency at New England Deaconess at Harvard Medical Center, and uh, her specialty uh, in endocrinology, her fellowship at Stanford uh, University. And she did also some research work in osteoporosis at Brigham's and Women's Children, uh, Brigham's and Will, uh, uh, Women's Hospital, excuse me, at Harvard, and clinical, she's also a clinical instructor at the University of Washington uh, uh, School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Kohlmeyer specializes in endocrinology and also with a special focus on the treatment and diagnosis of bone disorders, for example, osteoporosis. She's a co-founder of the Osteoporosis Resource and Screening Centers in Spokane, where they really provide an outstanding service. They provide free education and screening, and she's also the founder of, uh, of Strong Start and many, many more things. Uh, so we're very pleased. Uh, uh, to have her today join us to talk about Parkinson's and bone disease. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Lynn Kohlmeyer. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, well, as you can tell, this is my favorite topic, so I'm excited to uh, share with you, uh, you know, what's new with osteoporosis and fracture prevention, and then to try to really ease some of your concerns if you have them like many do from all the things you hear in the news and in, from your dentists and all the issues that come up regarding the osteoporosis medicines. We really want to want to give you the information about all that. Um, I think that one take home message is that um, it really doesn't matter what your bone density is, how strong your bones are if you never fracture. So that's different than a lot of other silent conditions where it matters what your blood pressure is because of all the heart and kidney risks that can happen that, you, that are silent that you don't feel. Um, same with cholesterol. But osteoporosis is silent also, but the, it, the difference is that if you don't fracture, you can live with osteoporosis forever and ever, and it doesn't affect your life. So our goal, even though we're going to talk about measuring some things in bone density and vitamin D, our goal is that you never fracture. Um, so if we wanted to focus on some of our main questions, um, one is how does Parkinson's disease influence fracture risk? A lot of those answers you already know, but we're going to focus on them. What does vitamin D do and how does it affect your bone health? 
what is osteoporosis and try to take it a step farther because I know you all know what osteoporosis is, even though I bet a decade ago people didn't all know even the word osteoporosis. So things have really changed in overall education, which is great. And can we reduce fractures? That's really the bottom line. So Parkinson's disease increases, the, your, increases fall risk, um, and that increases the risk of breaking a bone or a fracture. That's you know, as simple as it gets. Uh, Parkinson's disease makes it more difficult to exercise. Exercise is good for your muscle strength and your bones, and that has two different effects. That has effect on your actual bone quality and bone mineralization, not being able to be as active as you were before. Um, having Parkinson's, and it also has to do with your ability um, uh, to, to, to break a fall, so to speak, or to not fall. So what does vitamin D do to our bones? It enables us and maximizes calcium absorption. That's well known. But do you know how much of the calcium you take you absorb if your vitamin D level is low? Do you think it's... 10%, 50%, 75%. So if your vitamin D is low, and I'm going to tell you, well, what is low? Because that is somewhat controversial. Um, but how much of that calcium do you think you absorb? 10%. So if you're taking calcium three times a day and doing everything right, if your vitamin D is low, you don't absorb the calcium. And that's if everything else is um, on, on tip top. So there are other things that affect calcium and vitamin D absorption that we'll talk about. But what's really fascinating is that vitamin D affects our muscles. It affects a lot of other things, too. There's a lot of non-skeletal benefits from vitamin D. But we have vitamin D receptors in our muscles. We have less of them as we get older. Um, but vitamin D directly affects muscle strength. It directly affects fall risk. Um, so that's why it plays such an important part in that it's in the title of our discussion today. And then what is osteoporosis? Well, it's a skeletal disorder that's systemic. It's everywhere, even though our bones are different in our spine than our hip than our arm. They're all a little bit different in how they're made up. But it's a systemic bone condition that causes thinness of the bones that you don't feel. You don't want to use the word brittle. Um, that increases your risk of fracturing. And most all fractures, but let's talk about different types of fractures, occur with a fall. So. A hip fracture happens, unfortunately, when we fall. Do you think that most hip fractures occur after a fall? Do you think that 50% occur after a fall, 10%, or 90%? You know how you always think, which comes first? Did you fracture and then fall? We used to wonder about that with hip fracture, but that's actually very rare unless it's some kind of cancer or a, a different situation. People don't step off a curb and usually fracture and then fall. They fall and then fracture. 90% of hip fractures are after a fall. But spine fractures are a little bit different. I mean, you can be hugged a little too tight. You can cough terribly when you're sick, and you can have a, a rib or a spine fracture. So about 50% of spine fractures are after a fall. And then wrist fractures, almost all of them are after a fall. So bone strength is determined by bone density. It's not perfect. I'm going to talk a little bit about bone density because probably everyone here has had a bone density. If you're over 50, you don't, you don't want to get a bone density um, if you're too young. And if you do, you want to make sure it's compared to your same age. So that's important in, let's say, younger people on prednisone or with rheumatoid arthritis. They want to be compared to other men or women their age. So a bone density is not perfect, but it's definitely the best we have. And if you go to a place where they have good precision and they can really make some um, uh, good uh, comparisons between the scans, ideally on the same machine, then if you're on therapy or if you're deciding about therapy, you can that change in bone density can help you with that decision. Um, there's a difference between the heel ultrasound or finger or arm bone density that you may have heard of that's like a screening test versus the, versus the hip and spine bone density. So we'll, we'll go into that in a little more detail. So osteoporosis is silent um, because you don't feel osteoporosis. It doesn't hurt until you fracture. 
Um, it's very common. Over 10 million people have osteoporosis. There are one and a half million fractures a year, and that number's increasing, unfortunately. And 40% of women, 20% of men who are 50 or older, will have a fracture in their lifetime. Women are more likely to fracture. Part of that has to do with women's size, being smaller than men generally, but it's their bone size and their actual bone microarchitecture that just isn't built as well. Uh, and so uh, not only do women lose more bone as estrogen drops, um, but they also have that added risk. So 20% of osteoporosis cases are found in men and 30% of hip fractures are in men, despite most osteoporosis and fractures being in women. So one take home message of that is that really 30% of hip fractures occur in men. We don't even screen men as well as we should. So when, when there's anything affecting our balance, such as Parkinson's, then it doesn't matter whether you're a man or woman, osteoporosis and fracture prevention needs to be at the top of the list so we can prevent fractures. So can we reduce fractures? Well, definitely. Um, Parkinson's disease treatment not only improves mobility and activity, which improves balance and, and bone strength. And I know that you, with these monthly fantastic meetings that you have, you have a lot of information related to Parkinson's. And instead of that, I'm going to focus more on osteoporosis and vitamin D and balance. Exercise and vitamin D both improve balance and bone strength, and I want to tell you more about why that is. And osteoporosis prevention, by making the best bone density we can up until we're 30, which is where most of our strongest bone is for men and women, and then holding on to it, and then using medicine that you tolerate, that's safe, that's affordable, uh, to help prevent fractures. Those are all reasons why we can prevent fractures, and it's almost never too late to prevent a fracture or to prevent another fracture. Studies show that we can always make a difference. So I'll touch a little bit on osteoporosis um, update and the new medicines and things. I uh, want to talk specifically about what kinds of exercises, a little bit more about vitamin D and balance, um, preventing fractures with Parkinson's disease, and safety of osteoporosis medications. I, I just couldn't believe this picture. Can you believe that? Never say it's not my job. That's just classic. <laughs> that they painted right around the stem. <laughs> anyway. Okay. So there are three major influences in women uh, for our skeletons. Uh, one, of course, is estrogen. So when young women don't have as much estrogen, either they're on medicine for endometriosis or they're on... Um, uh, Depo Provera, which isn't good for your bones, or they have an eating disorder and they're not menstruating. All of these things aren't good for women in their bones. Um, and exercise, the more that we load our skeleton, the better it is, and calcium and vitamin D. So all three of those things, and lifestyle, which is kind of included in exercise, calcium, and vitamin D. Um, but when you take away um, estrogen, we need to think about medicines and menopause. But what's the, what's the equivalent for men? Yep. Testosterone in men is like estrogen in women as far as the skeleton goes. Men don't have menopause, we call it andropause, as regularly or as commonly as women do, but they do. So I would say any man who's at risk for falling or who has Parkinson's disease or who has um, prednisone treatment steroids for COPD or emphysema, or who has sleep apnea, interestingly, should have a testosterone level. Because all of those conditions are associated with low testosterone, even if you can't even tell that your testosterone's low. You might have menopausal symptoms like a woman. You might feel hot and sweaty and, you know, not be able to sleep. But it actually causes muscle weakness. So when men's testosterone levels drop, they fall more and they, they're, they're, they're more tired. So testosterone is important for the bones and it's also important for fall prevention and fracture prevention. So we have this stool with three, three legs of important things for bones. And if we take away estrogen for women and testosterone for men, we have to replace it with something. And that's where medicine comes in. We wish we didn't have to. And, and 20 years ago, Probably osteoporosis by 
a lot of people, including medical providers, felt, was felt to be a natural process of aging. And I think that we won't accept that anymore. I mean, there are a lot of things that happen with aging, um, and part of having your bones get thinner can't be explained by all the things we check and we test and we try to treat. Um, but it is something that we can do something about if we can do it safely. And one of the reasons why osteoporosis is endocrine, because endocrine are all the hormones, thyroid, testosterone, estrogen, is because calcium and vitamin D are both hormones. So the receptor for calcium was discovered about 25 years ago when I was in training. It's pretty exciting. Anything with a receptor is a hormone. And vitamin D, you make it in your skin from UVB light, from the sun. It is a hormone. It is not a vitamin. It should be hormone D. So that's why osteoporosis is endocrine, because half of people with thin bones or who fracture have an endocrine reason that they don't know about. Sometimes you know about it because you're taking prednisone for an important condition that it is treating. But you have an endocrine reason that thins your bones that we can do something about, we hope, that can help your skeleton in addition to having to talk about medicine. So even when you do everything right and you're exercising and you're taking calcium and vitamin D, once you're menopausal as a woman or once you're growing older, whether you're a man or woman, everybody's bones get thinner and everybody is at increased risk for fracture. So that's kind of the, the um, challenge that we're always up against. So let's talk first about exercise. Um, how often, uh, how hard, how long, and what type of exercise. Now, the Strides for Strong Bones is there, and I know we're going to talk about it afterwards, but we have a walk uh, or a run, if people want to run as well, uh, called Strides for Strong Bones. There's a photo book up here from last year. This is the second year. It's a nonprofit um, walk that we hope will be like Race for the Cure in the future or the walks that, that your uh, society puts on, just for calcium, vitamin D, and osteoporosis awareness. Um, and it's Saturday, August 20th at Medical Lake, and it's the day before the triathlon for osteoporosis that some of you might know about, the Wonder Woman Triathlon, which is for women. And at that triathlon, we have about 20, 25 osteoporosis teams where one woman has osteoporosis and the other women swim or bike for her on her team. But the walk is different, and one of the important aspects of walking is that it might not be as helpful as a medicine for your bones, but it definitely loads your skeleton. It gives our bones a reason to stay strong or get stronger, and it helps your balance. So some people might, you may have heard that walking is not good enough of an exercise for your bones or for osteoporosis, and I disagree with that. It is absolutely good enough. But if you can do more safely, it's even better. So if you were to think of the best type of exercise, if it didn't hurt you, and if you didn't fracture doing it, these are important, what do you think would be the best exercise for your bones? And it's been studied. Well, weightlifting is an important question. So weightlifting is important only in one way, which is surprising, because you'd think all that resistance on your muscles would be helpful to your bones, but it's just not enough. Your bones need more of a surprise, literally. So the only resistance weightlifting that helps your bones is back extension strengthening. So any of those band exercises you do, machines where you're pulling back safely because you don't want to hurt your back, or you're lying on a ball and you're lifting up. So the stronger your core is, the better you can work your back without hurting it. And initially the studies were too hard for any of us to do. And sure, they helped spine bone density and they were great. But then the, the studies over the last 10 years have have shown that you don't have to do it so hard and it still helps your back. So I think the easiest back exercise that actually proved to be beneficial was literally lying on a fairly hard mattress, not a really soft one, on your bed, putting a towel kind of underneath your hips and just lifting your back slightly just with that you know, motion and working your back muscles. Now, you know all of the different exercises. I don't know if you've been to physical therapy. I send everybody. St. Luke's likes that. Um, because it's good to have it shown to you in a really professional, safe way. And then if you can take it a step farther, I send triathletes and I send people that have 
broken their hip and they're afraid to start exercising again. The whole range of everybody benefits. So the bad side of that story is all the other resistance you do is good for you but doesn't help your bones. So working your biceps, working your quads, working your triceps, it's good for you. It might help your balance, but it hasn't been shown to help your bones. Now, that might not be completely true. How do we know if something helps our bones? We measure bone density, right? Or we, or we make sure that people don't fracture. There aren't very many fracture trials for exercise. Bone density is probably not good enough to show you the benefits of other exercise. So I'm not saying it's not helpful, but we can't measure it yet. There was one study that proves this. Which exercise do you think is the least helpful to your bones by bone density? Swimming. Swimming. Exactly. You're in a weightless environment. Doesn't help your bones at all. Don't quote me because there's a study that shows that that's wrong. What do you think is even, I'm going to tell you why, what do you think is even worse for your bones than swimming that we might be doing in 20 years just for fun? Going up in space. If you're in a gravity environment, you lose so much bone. When those astronauts walk off, uh, when they land, everybody's panicking they're going to fracture. They should not be walking. They should be in a wheelchair coming off. They need to regain their bone when they've been in space. They lose a lot of bone. And they've tried all sorts of exercises in space. They strap them down to the treadmill. They do, I mean, there haven't been that many NASA exercise bone trials, but there have been several. And all the astronauts and cosmonauts need medicine where they can lose a huge amount of bone, 1% a day. So, um, so if you swim, you need to do other things. And there was one study that disproved what I said, that swimming's not good for your bone. It was in master swimmers. These are older, excellent swimmers, and only the men had a benefit, not the women. And that's not fair. And that's because I would predict that they have more muscle. Muscle is important for your bones. So the second take-home message, you have to remind me what the first one was, is the more muscle you have, the better it is for your bones, even if you're not loading it, even if you're not jumping, even if not, you're not working your back. Because muscle talks to your skeleton in ways that we're just learning. It might have to do with serotonin, which is a hormone. Um, so the stronger you can be in whatever way that matters, it's the best for your bones. So back extension strengthening and loading your hip, walking, jumping. The most intensive exercises where women have been studied for 10 years, they're postmenopausal, they're not on estrogen, they don't have severe osteoporosis, and they haven't fractured. Otherwise, they, wouldn't, they weren't enrolled in this trial. But they wore weight vests, and they jumped off of two-foot blocks, and they had really good results. Now, you cannot and should not do that if you have a T-score of minus, minus 2.5 or lower at your back, and I'm going to talk about bone density, or if you're fractured. I mean, you can't do it with our blessings because it hasn't been studied, and I don't want you to hurt yourself. But when you walk and when you jump in a safe way, it's very good for your hip bone density. So when all the exercise trials have been looked at and there's meta-analysis and you come down, what do you recommend me to do for my bones. If you were able to and you're only allowed to use exercise, you need two and a half times your body weight impact at your hip. Okay, so that's not a realistic, safe thing that we can do, but that's what the studies show. If, on the other hand, you just want to improve your balance, improve your muscle, then three times a week, more intensive but more of a circuit, changing type of exercise. So it's not the same as the cardiovascular. You have to go so long and keep your heart rate up. Your bones want, um, uh, they respond better to literally being surprised. So in a safe way, you want to do different things that load your skeleton and strengthen your back um, a couple times a week, 10, 15 minutes. That's what helps your skeleton. And they've been jump rope, you know, little jumping trials. They've been back extension and walking trials, all sorts of different combinations. Uh, and the physical therapist can kind of give you a plan, and then you can transfer it to a trainer or do it on your own. And we can talk more about the details of that. So this is to remind us of the Strides for Strong Bones. If you want to sign up, I won't mention it too many times, we only have, we had 14 people last week 
We almost canceled. Now we, I think we have 40. But we would love to try to have 100 people. So if you could come and just walk the three miles, it's flat, beautiful around Medical Lake, we would love it. So this is what osteoporosis looks like. You can see normal bone on the right, uh, lots of connections between the calcium. And on the left, it's just emptier. There's just less bone. There's less bridges behind between the bone. It's just more fragile. It's more likely to fracture with pressure. Um, and I have to show you this slide. This is the bad cell. Osteoclasts are the cells we want to stop. So this, this is the cell. It looks, this is what it looks like. It looks like a little um, computer guy that's, you know, got all these little uh, dendritic processes. Essentially, it's digging. See this path that it's made? So this is an electron microscopy on the surface of bone. And this is normal. We need to have bone turnover to get at one hormone in our body. Where's most? What does our bone keep for us? Calcium, right? Most of our calcium's in our bone. And we need that calcium. We need it in our blood. We need it for muscle contraction. And so when you need calcium, these cells release calcium from your bone. And parathyroid hormone in your, behind your thyroid kind of is in regulation of that. Um, but if you fracture, if you have a stress fracture, if you're just having a micro damage to your bone, these cells come and they start cleaning it up and, and making your bone ready for the good cells, the osteoblasts that form bone over those resorption pits, they're called. So this is a normal process, but when, um, when a woman doesn't have estrogen or a man or woman's on prednisone or there's other reasons for bone loss, these resorption pits, these areas that these cells dig, get deeper, and your body can't fill them up. And so the bones get thinner, and then they break apart. So I have a little video here to show. I don't know. I think you can see pretty good without the lights. So the first thing you'll see is just kind of what it looks like, a normal skeleton. We're going into the, the bone of the spine. So this is the, the, the vertebra. This is the back part of your um, bone that we don't really measure. And if you go inside, they're going to show you the, the, the bad cells, the red cells or the osteoclasts. And they're just normally making this pit in the bone. It's called bone turnover, bone resorption. And they kind of come in the circulation and they, they coalesce. There might be, let's see, two or three. We'll see how many. This is just an animated version of it. And as they dig this um, resorption pit, the osteoblasts follow and they almost completely fill it up because this is in a normal, healthy woman, normal, healthy man. So this is called bone turnover. And this is important because when you hear on the news that these drugs are bad and they cause brittle bone because they decrease bone turnover for too long, I want you to know why that's not true or that it's just a theory. You know, we're open to making sure that things are safe. But you can see there's still a little bit of a line there. See how it's not quite, see that line right there? So if you had a pencil and you put a bunch of nicks in it, it would be easier to break than if it only had two nicks, right? So that's what these lines are. They, they kind of form a nidus for where the bone's a little less strong. So, But now we're going to look at osteoporosis. So the same exact process happens, but you're starting out with thinner bones because you're a man or woman with osteoporosis. And when you do that same process, it breaks right through breaks right through the connection between the bone, and that increases the risk of fracture. So while it's going, I want to talk about two types of medicines. One type of medicine is different than all the others, and that's called Forteo, parathyroid hormone, teraparatide. Those are all the different names for it. And what it does is it would take a man or woman with osteoporosis like this and it would increase the blue cells, the good cells that are forming bone. And because these two processes are linked, aside from strontium ranulate, we don't know how to separate it. So whatever you do to one, you do to the other. But Forteo is a different type of medicine because it increases the bone formation. So when you see the blue cells come, that's the cell that Forteo affects. And Forteo is very expensive, $1,200 a month. It's an injection every day, like an insulin shot you give yourself. People don't mind it. They like it. It's hard to stop once you're on if you have good coverage. 
and you can take it for two years, and it's been out almost 10 years, so it has a really good safety record. We can talk more about it. So those blue cells are increased by Forteo. But all the other medicines we have, estrogen, Evista, Miocalcin, Strontium, approved in Europe, not here, um, Fosamax, Actinel, Atelvia, the new Actinel after breakfast, Boniva, I have a slide with these on it, um, IV Reclast, they all decrease the red cells. They decrease the cells that are digging that pit. So one question is, well, why, why is that so bad? Why do they get such a bad reputation? So we're going to get back to that. But what are the risk factors for, for bone loss and fracture? Well, if you've broken a bone after the age of 50, unfortunately, no matter what your bone density is, you have osteoporosis by definition. Now, that's not true for every fracture. So right now, it's spine, hip, pelvis, um, and upper leg. So if, if you fell or you were in an accident and you broke your hip and you were over 50, you have osteoporosis by definition. And sometimes that doesn't seem fair. If it was a really bad accident and your bone density is pretty good. But the reason that is is because if you look at thousands of people over time, somebody that's had that happen to them fractures more later. And so there's, there's reasons why they meet criteria for osteoporosis. Now, if it's a wrist fracture, an ankle fracture, rib fracture, I still worry that your bones might be weaker than they look on bone density. But I can't say you have osteoporosis. But I still want to know. I want to know any fracture you have after you're 50. I want to know your ethnicity. I want to know your body mass index, because usually the thinner you are, the thinner your bones. I want to know your age, your activity level, your calcium, vitamin D. If you smoke now, because current smoking is bad for your bones, but if you quit, it's good. That's a reversible problem, as you know, for heart and lung. Alcohol, what's excessive? That's everybody's definition, but it's more than three units of alcohol a day, which um, the, the consensus is that's about two glasses of wine. Two good glasses of wine, not teeny little glasses. But, you know, less, less hard alcohol, more beer. It's still, it's moderation. Moderation is not always easy. But moderation isn't bad for your bones as far as alcohol. But excess is. Um, and estrogen in women, testosterone in men, and medicines. We can talk about the different medicines. And family history. Family history is huge. As we know, if somebody's parent, dad or mom, has broken their hip, that person's hip fracture risk is doubled, even if you don't know your bone density, even if your mother or father fell, even if they, it doesn't sound fair, but this is family history epidemiology. And that's true for grandfathers now. We have paternal and grandfather data, which is interesting. This used to all be you know, maternal, and we thought it was a mother um, risk, but it's paternal as well. So if you're computer savvy and you like this, and you've never been on medicine, so this doesn't really apply to people that are on medicine, but it's still interesting. You can Google the word, Google the word frax. Google's a new verb, I guess. F-R-A-X. And it's a fracture assessment that took 10 years for a bunch of experts to come together and and, and it, it was developed in the UK by Dr. Canis. And it looks like this. You pick English, you pick, pick United States, um, and you answer uh, 12 questions. And it's going to give you your 10-year fracture risk. You can't do it if you're less than 45. And what does that tell us? The third take-home message is what's the most important risk factor for fracture, age. So if you have a bone density of minus 4, we'll get to bone density, and you're 50 versus 70, even if everything's the same, your risk of fracture is higher when you're older. So we want to know your age, and that's one of the first questions here. They're not always in, in um, uh, order of importance, but it wants to know if you were ever on steroids, ever even 10 years ago. Not inhaled steroids and not topical steroids, even though high doses affect your bones, but have you had a shot of steroids? Have you had a prednisone dose? 
that doesn't seem fair if you only had it once. Usually one shot a year of prednisone shouldn't be bad for your bones, but steroids are bad for your bones. Kenalog in shots, prednisone. Uh, it's going to ask, uh, all these things we've already talked about, but the one thing we haven't talked about is rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis, even if um, you're not on medicine, isn't good for your bones. And it probably has to do with things related to the condition with inflammation and cytokines. And, and it sh there should be a balance question on here. Parkinson should be on this list. But what they do instead is they have one question that says secondary osteoporosis. Is there anything else that you know that affects your fracture risk? And you would answer yes or no there. So sometimes this, but, but usually if you've already fractured or if you know you have osteoporosis, you don't need to do this test. So FRAX is more for um, that difficult period of time when your bone density really isn't too thin and you want to prevent it from, from thinning. So in the meantime, bone density is still our best test and it's a quick x-ray. It's like going up in an airplane, so it's not like a chest x-ray, but it is x-ray and it just measures the difference between soft tissue and bone. Um, and it takes a few minutes and you don't have to uh, declothe. You can't have any zippers or piercings or anything metal in your pocket because that makes it hard to, to measure. And it's very precise um, and accurate. And we measure the hip, spine. We can measure the arm. And we can do total body. We do that often in kids. And we can do body composition. Because in the future, I'm going to want to know your bone density and I'm going to want to know your muscle mass. I'm going to have your lean mass measured on this machine. I'm going to say, you're doing great. Your, your muscle, uh, uh, you're working on keeping your muscles. This is good for your fracture prevention. Um, that's what it looks like, the spine bone density. I'm sure many of you have seen that. And the hip down there at the bottom, right? Different areas of the hip, the spine. We only measure the bottom four. I'd like to measure all of them, but that's just where all the data is. So that's how we measure bone density. And then that's a picture. It looks like a skeleton, but that's the picture of what the body composition turns out to be like. Now, how does that differ from the heel ultrasound um, or x-ray heel machine? Uh, the difference is when, when you see at a fair a, a heel or arm bone density, if you've already had the more precise test, the hip and spine, just skip it. Just fight your temptation to have the free test because it's just a waste. It's like an eye test across the room rather than being refracted for your glasses. It's just a waste of resources. So if you're at a, you know, Albertsons or the triathlon or at the Deaconess or Sacred Heart and they're offering free heel bone density screening tests. Don't do it if you've had the better test, but get someone else to come. Bring a man who's never had a screening test. We don't screen men. Or bring a friend who's over 30. They have to be over 30. So these tests are good, but they're one time only. They, you can't compare them. And they're just, there's, there's more mistakes. You could still have osteoporosis and this test might still look okay. It's just not as sensitive. Now, the other thing we do is called a VFA, vertebral fracture assessment, a fancy way of saying a sideways x-ray of your whole back. But on the bone density machine, it's very little radiation. It's like getting up in an airplane again. Not that radiation is, is harmful if you, know, if, if you have an important reason for the test, but it can show you fractures that you don't know about. I don't know if you might have to turn the light down to see that. But do you see how we're looking at the white part now? See how that's a rectangle like that? So those are your backbones. See how that's a rectangle? We're looking at the white lines. It's not easy to see because this is very little x-ray. See that rectangle? These are nice, tall, good vertebra. See how this one is crushed? See how it's wedged? Believe it or not, two out of three of fractures like that in women aren't even felt. And that's how you get a curve in your back. And, and no neurosurgeon or back specialist has ever really been able to explain how can you fracture like that and it not hurt. It must be so slow that you don't have a lot of inflammation. But nine out of 10 in men are painless. So either they're tougher or they're blaming their back pain on something else, or it's just different than women. So if you've had a fracture like this and you didn't know you did, 
that's not good. That still increases your fracture risk. And so that's why if some people come in to my office and, and they have osteoporosis, I'm going to want this test because if it looks good, if they're all nice and tall like this, that's just one more positive in all of our assessments. Now, what else can you see here? This isn't why we do this test, but do you see this? See how it's kind of white right there? That's the person's aorta. So you don't want all that calcium in your aorta. So in the future, we might be able to use this test as kind of an inexpensive, quick calcium score. And, and one question you might ask me later is, how do you know the calcium you, don't, you take for your bones doesn't go to your aorta? How do you know it doesn't go to your heart? Remember that, uh, that, that report a few months ago? Um, and, and it doesn't. <laughs> I don't know how you can trust me on that, but there have been enough studies that disprove that report. Um, and the osteoporosis medicines do not put calcium where you don't want it. I mean, that was the very first question that was asked appropriately 20 years ago. If we're going to you, if we're going to find medicines that make your bones stronger, the calcium better be put in the right place in your bones and not in your arteries or your heart. Okay, so how much calcium, thank you, do you need? It used to be 1,500. Remember, that was the, the magic word. But because of the Women's Health Initiative, there was a 17% increased relative risk of kidney stones in the woman that took their calcium. You can take too much calcium if you're a stone former, it's not good. If you're not a stone former, it doesn't matter. How do you know? Well, I can find out sometimes because I unfortunately ask a lot of my patients to collect a urine for 24 hours. not very fun, but it tells me a whole bunch. It tells me how much calcium they're holding on to or not. It tells me hormones. It tells me uh, kidney function. It's a really important test. And if you're leaking calcium like 20% of people do when they have thin bones, you might be a kidney stone former and not know it, and we don't want to do anything to increase somebody's stone risk. So because of that, the number went down to 1,200. And you got to split it up. So unlike vitamin D, you could take 100,000 at once. I don't recommend it, but it's been done in studies and been safe. Calcium, need, you need to split up. In the best situation with the best vitamin D, you still absorb only so much of your calcium. So you want to split it up about 300 to 600 max in one uh, supplement or dietary calcium. And you want to get that twice a day, three times a day. And your total calcium intake is the 1,200. And the best calcium to take is the one you'll take, the one you like, the one you tolerate, the one that's affordable. Now, are all calciums the same? Sometimes we see calcium pills on x-ray, which means you didn't absorb it. It's this nice little tablet sitting there. That's not common, and we can't always tell whether what you buy over the counter is really in there, unfortunately. That's sort of belief. We tend to believe a lot of over-the-counter things more than we do medicines, which I don't think is right. But some calciums might not really be in what you buy. And maybe liquid calcium is better for some people because you don't have to worry about the, the dissolvent in it. But in general, a, a fairly well-known calcium brand is going to be absorbed if your vitamin D is good and if you don't have an absorption uh, problem, like if you haven't had gastric bypass surgery, if you don't have celiac or other things. So the best calcium is the one you'll take. Now, I might change my mind with that if you're leaking a lot of calcium. I want, might want you on a certain type of calcium. I might not want you on as much. I want to make sure your bones are getting stronger without risking your kidneys or a kidney uh, stone. So here are all the different types. Do you need magnesium and boron and zinc? And they put soy, uh, phytoestrogens in calcium. I can't believe the Citrical company does that. It's completely marketing. So it's probably fine, but really the best calcium is the one that you tolerate that you get vitamin D. Magnesium helps you not get as constipated from the calcium. There's no true calcium-magnesium ratio that's clinically been proven. So from a cellular standpoint, and in people in the intensive care unit, magnesium is very important. But when you're out and about and eating regularly, 
most of the magnesium is in your muscle, and you don't need to take magnesium with your calcium. But if you feel better with it and you like it, that's great. I would just recommend not taking more than the recommended daily intake of magnesium because then it could cause diarrhea and loose stools, and it actually decreases bone formation if you take too much magnesium. That's about five to 600 milligrams is about the recommended daily intake. And all the other things really have not been proven. That doesn't mean they won't in the future, but boron was very exciting a while ago, but the Stanford trial about eight years ago showed it didn't, didn't do anything, didn't reduce fractures. Um, vitamin K looked very interesting, didn't reduce fractures. So, you know, there might be more things we learn about in the future, but right now, as far as over-the-counter uh, help for your skeleton, it's really calcium and vitamin D. So vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, A, D, E, and K are all fat-soluble. And you can cause toxicity if you take too much. Vitamin A toxicity is not good for your bones. And that happened in, up in Alaska where people are drink, eating too much whale meat and it's, it's, it raises the calcium in your blood. It's a problem. We don't see it in Spokane. Um, it's hard to cause vitamin D toxicity, but you can do it if you take somewhere between 10,000 and 50,000 or more a day, you can cause vitamin D toxicity. And we're not sure whether it's the level in your blood or the calcium in your blood, but you're not gonna cause vitamin D toxicity if you're taking 1,000 to 4,000 or 5,000 of vitamin D. So right now, despite the Institute of Medicine causing big havoc with the recommendations for good reason they're not going to give you a recommendation unless there's a lot of good data to back it up and there is not a lot of good data to push your vitamin d level above 32 to 40 nanograms per milliliter when you get your vitamin d level checked in your blood isn't it interesting that i just assume that we're going to check your vitamin d level this was not the case five years ago vitamin d is one of the most common things to get a blood test for and that's new in the last two years we didn't have that Angie, did we 10 years ago? We didn't measure vitamin D. We wanted to know. Angie's been in endocrine doing osteoporosis for a long time. But now we want to know everybody's vitamin D. We probably don't need to keep measuring it. There's no guidelines. If you had it last year and you're doing good, you don't need it again. And you probably shouldn't get it measured until you've been on some vitamin D at least for three months because it's going to be low. 50% of us have a level less than 25. Um, but the Institute of Medicine said a level of 20 is fine. But all the calcium experts around the country said, no, 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 that's not enough. So the third take-home message, fourth take-home message, is you want your vitamin D level to be about 32 to 40, and the units all the same, nanograms, NG slash ML, and that's a 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And you don't really have to remember that now because the doctors and the labs are doing a great job, but a couple of years ago, the wrong vitamin D was measured, and now, now it's easy. So 32 to 40. And you can ask me questions about, well, what happens if my doctor wants it higher? Where is that coming from? What's the data? So we're almost running out of time. So medicines, we have hormones and we have non-hormones. So the hormones are estrogen in women. Estrogen is great for bones. Unfortunately, estrogen has other risks. The HT used to be HRT, Hormone Replacement Therapy. They took out the R, I don't know, five years ago. It's HT now and ET. So HT is Hormone Replacement. That means progesterone with estrogen for women that have a uterus still. Uh, Evistas are only CIRM. CIRM is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. I just remember designer estrogen. It's a designer anti-estrogen, really, because it prevents breast cancer but it's good for your bones. So Evista is not very strong for bones. It doesn't prevent hip fracture, but it's a great um, hormone to hold your bone density steady and to prevent spine fractures and its other benefits. Then we have the hormone PTH, parathyroid hormone, Forteo. Parathyroids are right behind your thyroid, but it's a synthetic piece of your own parathyroid hormone. If you want to talk natural, maybe that's the most natural of all the medicines. And it's the one that's an injection every day for two years. Calcitonin miocalcin is a nasal spray. I don't think that it is very good for osteoporosis, but it's still on the market. And then all our non-hormonals. The non-hormonals now are split up into two categories. 
We have the bisphosphonates, the ones that get all the bad media rap. They're literally soaps. They are soaps. Fosamax is a soap. But it's a good soap, believe it or not. You don't absorb it very much, but it gets into your bone in the tiniest way, and it prevents bone loss and reduces fractures. Um, but now you could get it intravenously. You could get it by a quick injection. So you know that Boniva, Reclast. Um, Atelvia is the new after breakfast Actinel. So you don't have to wait a half an hour and stand up and all those things you remember. So there's a lot of different, different ones. I, I would say that I'm not a big fan of generic Fosamax, unfortunately. Um, and I like a lot of other generics, but only 0.6% of this type of drug is absorbed when you take it orally. And so I just don't know if the same generic company is going to put the Fosamax in a different um, binder and, and affect that absorption. Because a generic has to be, you get different numbers, but it's anywhere from in the mid 80s to 104% bioavailability. And then uh, we're almost done. The new medicine that's not a hormone. It's a vaccine. It's a monoclonal antibody. It's called Prolia, and it's a sub-Q shot twice a year, completely different than the other medicines. It never gets into your bone. Not that that's bad, but that's what the Fosamax-like medicine does. Um, but it goes to those red cells that we want to get rid of, the osteoclasts, and it decreases them before they even get to the bone. So it's in your circulation. And it's made to look just like a protein we make osteoprotegrin. It's a cytokine. So it's a really exciting new medicine. It's been studied in about 10,000 women for five years, another two years, seven years, but it's only been out one month, one year, and two months. It came out June of last year. So it's new. Um, so here's what they all look like, and you've seen a lot of these. So I think that an important message is that if you have osteoporosis and you're fractured, you really need to be on a medicine. You're not a candidate for what we're calling, which sounds funny, but it, it has some meaning, a drug holiday. We're calling a drug holiday when you're on your medicine for osteoporosis and you stop it. You could consider a drug holiday for all sorts of reasons, but not if you're fractured and not if you're on prednisone and not if you're at high risk for falling and you have osteoporosis. So the safety of medicines uh, is important. Um, and all of the theories about forming brittle bone and atypical fractures and osteonecrosis of the jaw are all theories. And the possible association is incredibly rare. So for osteoporosis doses of the Fosamax-like drugs, and maybe for Prolia too, because remember, it's the same... Uh, it goes at those red cells to decrease them. And the theory is that if you do that too much, then the circulation of the jaw is compromised and you could get a necrotic area, osteonecrosis of the jaw. But the actual risk of that is as uncommon as getting penicillin, having an anaphylactic reaction, and dying. And can you believe how many people insist they get an antibiotic when they're sick? even though we know we're not supposed to because it's mostly a virus. But you want an antibiotic when you're sick because you feel so bad. The risk of dying from that antibiotic is more than the possible risk of osteonecrosis of the jaw from the osteoporosis medicines. And I don't have a lot of time to talk about it right now, but if you have metastatic cancer and you're on huge doses of the osteoporosis-like medicines, so you're on the Zometa, Iridia, Exgeva, those are the osteoporosis doses, then your risk of O&J is real. It's not hypothesis, but it's 0.6 to 2% risk. It's less risky than all the other chemotherapy medicines you're on. So when you, when you go to a dentist, if they won't give you state-of-the-art care, if you can't get an infected tooth pulled, you need to see somebody like me, and you need to ask your dentist, you know, are you giving me the exact same care as you would if I didn't have osteoporosis and I wasn't on this medicine? It's so important. Um, and then lastly, the atypical fractures that you've heard about or the brittle bone, incredibly rare. There's a few hundred reported. 
out of millions of people over the last 15 years. Fosamax came out in 1995. So we, we're not sure whether it's related to being on these medicines more than 10 years. Most of the people with these atypical fractures, low hip fractures, had fractures before they ever started the medicines, different fractures. So our job is to make th sure things are safe. The most important message is to take the importance of your balance and your medicines uh, with Parkinson's and to balance your fracture risk with the medicines and the, the pros and cons of the medicine. So I'm going to stop there. We have questions later. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Kohlmeyer. Uh, outstanding uh, talk, uh, some great information. So we'll try to bring up those little takeaways at the very end again to make sure people are, are aware of what uh, things you should be thinking about when you leave here today. Um, but again, if the remote sites, if you'd all please open up your microphones. So take them off mute and uh, we'll begin the Q&A. And again, just a reminder, uh, I call uh, your respective site. If you would uh, please tell me how many are in attendance in the room that you're at. You that would be very helpful. Well. I get a feel for overall attendance, okay? Yeah, uh, we've got 15 sites plus Spokane today. Yeah, I think we need to chill it back on. So I'm going to mix and match. So if everybody's ready, uh, 33 here in Spokane. Okay. Oh. Okay, so let's get started uh, with our uh, friends out in uh, Anchorage, Alaska at Providence uh, Anchorage Medical Center. Uh, if you're there, if you first give me attendance and let me know if you have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. We are unable to communicate. We have no link. I'm sorry? Yeah, there. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, we've got, uh, looks like uh, five. five people here. Okay, and, and do you have a question? Which question, sorry? Yes, I have a question. Uh, I had a back surgery recently on my spine, and I was wondering when they did that surgery, does that make me at a higher risk? I had really good bone density beforehand, because or else they wouldn't have done the, done the surgery. Yeah, good question. Uh, when you have other spine conditions, arthritis or disc, and you have surgery, it does not affect your bone strength that we know of. Um, some of the neurosurgeons have preferences on what medicines you should be on before or after surgery, but there have been no studies that have um, proven that any of the osteoporosis medicines are bad around surgery, and some of them actually uh, may help with healing, such as Forteo. So no, it shouldn't be related to your fracture risk. And then I have one more question. If you have, if you have really bad uh, arthritis in your knee, behind your kneecap, <coughs> something a good idea? I mean, arthritis isn't related to osteoporosis that we know of, though there are medicines that are being discovered to treat both. So I would just worry about your fall risk. Okay. Thank you. We have another question. Okay, go ahead. One more question. Uh, is there a genetic test for osteoporosis or a genetic tendency to have that? Great question. Genetic tests, they're working on it. Right now, because it's multifactorial, as you might imagine, there isn't one test, but about 15 years ago, the vitamin D receptor was thought to be a genetic test. And a lot of people got tested, and there was a bunch of studies, but it, 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 it looked like it was true in Australia, but not in the United States. And so no one test yet. OK. Thank you so much. Appreciate your questions. Welcome. Uh, let's go to OMAC uh, Mid Valley Hospital. Uh, please uh, give me your attendance, and then if you have a question. Yeah. You must be skipping around. I'm sorry. We'll come back. Okay, let's go to Walla Walla. Uh, Providence St. Yes. Mary's. Can, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, there are three of us today. Uh, it's quite small. We usually have a half a dozen people. Well, thank you for being there. And, and uh, we have, have a couple have a of questions. Yes, I do. Uh, I have access to a swimming pool, and I wanted to, I, I don't swim, 
but I use like a, uh, like barbells that are styrofoam, and then they have the noodles. Uh, what I do, my legs are the worst part of me, and I just kind of w work my legs back and forth in the water. Do you have any suggestions as to what to do in the water that would help? None of that's going to help your bones, but if it helps your balance and you feel better in your mobility, that's a good thing. Any other questions, uh, folks? Okay, let's go to Billings, Montana, Deaconess Billings. There are eight of us. Excellent. Thank you for being there. And do you have any questions? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we do. Okay, go ahead. Does the doctor have any book out or anything that we can... Uh, well, we have a, a website for our local patients here in Spokane, which is called SpokaneOsteoporosis.com, uh, and it's linked to all sorts of great sites, the uh, National Osteoporosis Foundation and uh, the Dairy Council, and so if you go online and look at our website and look at all the links, um, I think you could get a lot of good information from that. I have one more question. I've uh, broken a lot of bones over the years uh, in my profession as a rancher, but uh, it takes quite a bit to break one. Is, is it, does that put me in any further risk of uh, fractures later on? Yeah, that's a great question. So does, do traumatic fractures count as far as osteoporosis? If you were over 50 when you fractured and it was a spine, leg, upper leg, hip, or pelvis, then it counts. and it, you know, if you have a really good bone density, we make exceptions um, for sure. But we worry more if you fractured because most people fall and don't fracture. I, so I, went, over backwards, I went over backwards going up some stairs, and I got touched down. I went over backwards all the way down. I didn't break anything. Is that so that's a good question too. If you fall and you don't fracture, it doesn't mean your bones are strong. It means that you were lucky. One percent, only one percent of falls result in a fracture. So most people fall. How many people fell in the last year in this room? <laughs> so thankfully we don't all fracture. But, you know, if, if you fractured, even being strong and a, and a rancher, I would get your bone density. The hard part in men is, is if your bone density can be back to normal, even if you've fallen and fractured, insurance doesn't always pay. Yeah. So... That's why the screening tests help, those, those screening tests. Thank you very much. Very nice talk. 1% of falls result in a fracture. I know. That's good. <laughs> okay. Let's uh, move on. To our, uh, let's see here. Tenasca North Valley Hospital. We have no questions. Thank you. And how many are in attendance, please? Uh, three of us. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Clarkston, Tri-State Memorial. Good afternoon, Dr. Kohlmeyer. Uh, we have 13 attending here. Oh, excellent. And we have two, two questions. Uh, first, Dr. Kohlmeyer, do you have an opinion on statins and any impact on osteoporosis? And the second question would be, what, are, what foods are best to eat for calcium? Great question. So, you know, the statins are in the, in the long line of medicines that hopefully people ask me about, like the proton pump inhibitors, like Prilosec, like the Actos Avandia TZDs for diabetes. All of these have been kind of mentioned as possibly affecting bones. Actually, the statins were felt to maybe be good for bone because they affect the same pathway as the bisphosphonates, but it never really panned out. It was too site-specific. Statins are good for your cholesterol. Um, reducing plaque. So right now, we don't think that statins help your bones. As far as food go, you know, I wouldn't count vegetables. Vegetables are so important, and you should have vegetables anyway. But you, you need to eat a lot of vegetables to get calcium. So really what you need to count if you're going to be, you know, kind of time efficient with it is dairy and fortified food. So if you can't take dairy because you're lactose intolerant, um, then you need to look at fortified foods. Um, I think with celiac and being gluten-free, uh, that also makes it harder. Um, but there are a lot of good ways to get calcium in your food, so you don't need to take supplements. 
It's hard to get vitamin D, though, so I would always take vitamin D as a supplement. Thank you. All right. Thanks for your questions and for everybody there. Okay, let's move on to uh, Pullman Regional Hospital. Okay, we can always come back to you. Uh, Coeur d'Alene, uh, Kootenai Medical Center. Uh, yes, we have seven people here today. We don't have any questions. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, Port Townsend, or excuse me, I'm sorry, Pendleton, Oregon. Yes, we have uh, five people here today. Any questions? And no questions. All right, thank you for attending. Uh, Providence uh, Mount Carmel Hospital in uh, Colville. Hi, we have two in attendance today. And I have a, a question. The doctor mentioned exercise that, that gets changed up. So what about curves the, where they go from machine to machine? Is, is that good for <coughs> bone health? Curves is good. Uh, the the disadvantage is that most of curves is resistance, and <laughs> the only really resistance exercise that I mentioned that's good for your bones is back extension strengthening. They do have some back extension exercises at curves, but then when you're on the stations where you can jump or walk, you know you got to remember it's really the loading, different types of loading. So I think curves is great. I think yoga is good and Pilates and Zumba and everything. I think that the safety issues are threefold. One, you don't want to forward flex your spine excessively when you have osteoporosis. We don't do those sit-ups anymore where you come all the way up and crunch. Um, you don't want to lean forward and lift. That's a lot of pressure on your spine. That's true really for any everything. Um, and you don't want to do a lot of twisting, sort of freeze, too much twisting. So the good thing about these different types of exercises, Tai Chi, and they've all been studied, is that it really helps your core and your balance. And there's a lot of proprioception, actually, when you exercise. I remember when you, if, if, if you, when you were younger, if you did a sport, or even now, you know, when you think you're going to do something and then you see your body do that, whether it's a golf swing or if it's a gymnastics move or, or a tennis, that, that mind-body kind of connection is really important. We don't do that as much as we get older. And so sometimes these exercises are just really good for that, and that helps balance and, and helps our fracture prevention. Well, at, at the risk of sounding really ignorant, what exactly do you mean when you say load? Uh, loading your hip or any, right. kind of, any kind of impact to your bones that uh, – is literally an impact. So okay. the only way we normally impact safely is walking and jumping. But let's say wrestlers that are thrown down on their side, that's good for their hip bone density if they don't hurt themselves. So in the future, we'll have other ways to load our skeleton, like vibration plates that people stand on and sit on. That's been studied. Um, not the ones at the mall, not the ones that are available right now. They, they're not the ones that have been studied. But if the bone gets pounded in a, in a, not saying it quite as professionally, in a safe way, it sends messages to the cells to make it stronger. So the only way we can really load our skeleton now is to walk and jump and to do back extension exercises. You might think about punching something would load your arm, but that's just never been studied. Thank you. All right, thanks. And more than likely, we're not going to recommend wrestling camps now, right? No. <laughs> right. That's an individual decision. <laughs> okay, um, let's go to uh, Samaritan Healthcare in Moses Lake. Hi, we have five here. Thank you. And any questions? That's about carrying things. About what? Carrying. Carrying things? Yeah, like uh, cases of oil. Uh, okay, okay, he carries cases of oil. How is that going to... Uh, no, that's a great question. What's the safety of carrying things and lifting things? You know, the minute you lean forward and lift, whether you're twisting or just... I don't just, want to hold you up here. Uh, when you, you, when you carry you? something or lift something, it puts a lot of pressure on your spine. This is just life. We have to do it. You want I think, to just, well, I don't know. He said they had 18 sites. You want to just be really careful that you're kind of over your center of gravity. 
Um, if you're lifting young kids or things out of the trunk, you want to you want to be close to it before you lift. You remember kind of all the muscle back safety things. Well, we're taking it a step farther because you can lift something and fracture. And I have unfortunately a lot of patients that do that. You know, they just lean forward and it's not common, thankfully. But um, and I would say if you have osteoporosis and you've fractured, never put your suitcase up in an airport. Someone else has got to do that for you. And I know even if it's embarrassing or you do not want to check your bag, I totally understand that. It's just, you know, you're always in a crunch. Someone's in your way. You're, you're, it's just so bad for your back. So um, an example of something like that where you're doing this, you're twisting, I mean, that's just the worst. <laughs> so get some help. <laughs> exactly. Right. Not always yeah. easy. <laughs> Any other questions? No. No, thank you. All right, thank you for joining us. Uh, let's go to Dayton General Hospital. Yes, Dayton General has, uh, th has four people in attendance, and we enjoy your program very much. No thank questions. You. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Miles City, Montana. Okay, we can always come back. Okay, let's go to uh, Grangeville, Idaho. Syringa General. Okay. And uh, Kirkland, Evergreen Healthcare, folks. Out in Hi. Hi. Can you hear us? Yes. Uh, we have five people. Thank you. And, and we have one question. <coughs> yes. I Two questions. I have a question. Uh, a, a question. Um, could you comment on the relationship between sunshine and vitamin D? Yes. So uh, you, the, the, the sun gives you UVB lights that goes to your skin to make vitamin D. Um, it's a great thing. Uh, there's three things to think about, though. Uh, we do it less well as we get older, especially when we have spots on our skin, especially when our skin is darker, either if you're tanner or ethnicity, and especially if you put any on any sunblock, which you should do. So any sunblock blocks D. So you don't want to depend on the sun. The sun's great, but you want to protect your skin. Uh, I think something that's really fascinating is why don't we get vitamin D toxic when the sun? Can you imagine when you were a kid how much vitamin D you would make? 300,000 units in an afternoon. And they haven't really figured out how you don't get detoxic, but your skin turns off its production of D. And, you know, everybody might have their own mechanism like that, just like we do for thyroid, all the other inhibiting controls we do for endocrine. But anyway, so we, there's a lot more to learn about vitamin D, and you do make vitamin D in your skin, but I'd still depend on the supplements um, and protect your skin. Another question? Um, Are you finished? Yeah. Another question? I have a question. Okay. okay. Go ahead. I don't think they're hearing. No, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. You were looking the other way. Uh, you mentioned proton pump inhibitors, add acids. Pr um, could you make yes. a little, what would say a yes. little more so about those? About five years ago, there was a nursing health study that people on proton pump inhibitors, women had uh, twice the fracture risk. And so then everybody looked at it and there were studies in Canada and the United States and it looked like if you've been on a Prilosec-like medicine for more than four to six years, depending on the study, you did have an increased fracture risk and, and decreased bone density. And maybe that was due to calcium absorption problems. Maybe it was due to decreased bone formation. You know, it doesn't really seem to be a, a huge um, uh, reason to lose bone or fracture, and these drugs are so incredibly important for tolerating life. Uh, I think that if if you have been on a proton pump inhibitor, it might be a reason to get a bone density. It doesn't mean insurance would pay if you don't have another reason. I think if you're a woman, you usually don't have a problem with getting a bone density, but we have to think about that in men. Bone densities aren't very expensive. They're anywhere from 60 to $140, depending on insurance. So it's not, it's not like an MRI. So a bone density is something we're starting to think more about in people that have been on a proton pump inhibitor for more than a few years. And you just need to make sure you get your calcium. And you don't want to take your calcium at the same time. 
Now, proton pump inhibitors are fairly long-acting, so we're not exactly sure what the right time course is, but if you take them apart, that'd probably be a good idea. Thank you. I have a question, and it's concerning. I'm a 70-year-old man. Uh, my spine or my height has shrunk two to two and a half inches, and I wonder what my risk factor is. That Does that change the risk factor? For fracture? Well, yeah, no. So height loss. Height loss might be a sign of vertebral fracture that you didn't feel or you had back pain and then it got better and you blamed it on something else, which is common. Um, I don't know how many years ago, but in Idaho, a two inch or more height loss would pay for a bone density. You could say height loss as a code. Now you have to say fracture. So if you've had height loss, and really everyone should get their height every year after they're 40. You know, when you go in for your physical, and sh your shoes should be off. It should be a good stadiometer because um, it's a great way to think about your bones. And if you've lost more than probably an inch and a half in height and it's done properly, we want to know what your bone density is. Uh, the hard part is if you're a man with no other risks, even though the National Osteoporosis Foundation says every man over 70 <coughs> should get a bone density, they give that recommendation, but again, it doesn't mean it would be paid for if it comes back good, kind of like mammogram 30 years ago. Um, if your mammogram was good as a woman a long time ago, it wouldn't get covered. So, um, but that's where the heel screeners come in. You know, you could get, go to a fair or get a heel screen, or, you know, you might sign a waiver that you would get charged what your insurance would pay, and Medicare pays about $68 for bone density, so it's very worth it. It's a good question. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody, uh, spoke, our Spokane audience, and please, uh, Walt, will bring around the mic if you have a question. So raise your hand, please. Is that all? Can you just clarify? So if you're doing the jumping exercises and or on the osteoporosis medications, does that actually increase your bone mineral density, or does Both it just together? And or. So separate, or does it just prevent it from decreasing? And does age have any role? Oh, right. So all the medicines, even though all the medicines except for Forteo are designed to decrease those red cells, which decrease bone density. So you're taking a medicine that decreases bone loss. You still gain bone. So the, a lot of it's semantics and marketing and things. But you get fracture prevention in older people that it's been studied in much sooner than you actually see an increase in bone. So if you gain anywhere from, let's say, 3 to 6% over a few years with the Fosamax-like medicines, maybe up to 11% in 10 years, your fracture reduction, and I'm glad you asked this because I didn't even say, I should have said, is 50% at the hip, 50% reduction or even more of hip fractures within months, really, of taking it in studies. We don't measure bone density that quickly. And spine fractures are reduced 60 to 80 percent with the medicine. And really, the medicines work well. Exercise doesn't have any fracture data, really, not as good, because you need thousands of people. There are trials in people and in animals, much more in animals, where they do medicine and exercise together. And they do um, uh, work together in a, um, uh, an additive way. So I think that. Adding exercise to medical treatment absolutely improves your uh, fracture prevention and your bone density, and that's been um, that's been shown in all sorts of interesting ways that I could talk about later if you're interested. Can you hear me in Spokane? Uh, yes, just a minute. Um, age does matter, and when you look at all the exercise trials, you get most effective exercise when you're putting down your peak bone density. So. That is in girls, maybe 10 to 12. They put down most of their calcium in their bone. And in boys, maybe 12 to 14. But you still keep gaining bone up until you're 30. Not so much in your 20s, but a little bit more. So the exercise trials show amazing thing in younger people. And then in, in premenopausal women that are you know, holding on to their peak bone density, excellent exercise effects. Less so when we're older, but you still see maintenance of bone density and a little bit of increase, but you have to, it's, it's more intensive exercise. I do have one more question. Could sure. you tell me? I was told that I should not take calcium with my thyroid medicine. Is that true? Yeah, so it's better to take them together than not to take them because 
it decreases thyroid absorption maybe by 15 to 20 percent, but it's better than not taking it at all. But the calcium does decrease thyroid absorption. It doesn't decrease calcium absorption that we know of. So the thyroid, you know, you're, you're getting your calcium. But that is better to split up. Now there's a double release calcium. Have you seen this citricale? You take it in the morning and you get a little bump in calcium so you don't have to take it twice a day. I mean, they should have discovered this a long time ago. So it's kind of slow release calcium. Uh, it's kind of like Dexalon or Capidex, that proton pump inhibitor that you take it once a day, but you get a little, another little blip of medicine later in the day. Um, I think it's going to make it hard for figuring out some of your medicines to maximize absorption, but if you're getting a good blood test and your thyroid levels are good, you should be fine. Um, with osteopenia, I think it's called pre-osteoporosis, is that fully reversible, and, um, or is it, can you get your bone structure all yeah. the way back? So great, the word osteopenia has been used a lot in the past, but we're going to try not to ever say it again. <laughs> because it sounds bad. Doesn't it sound terrible? It is not terrible. So it's pre-osteoporosis, like you said. But we don't even call it that. We call it low bone density. And that, and that is for a really good reason, because there have been you know, young premenopausal women, maybe young men, who aren't at very high fracture risk, who have a T-score of minus uh, 2 or so, minus 2.5 or lowers osteoporosis. And they've been put on medicine because they were told they had osteopenia when they're still having normal periods. Or so to answer your question, though, with somebody who has a low bone density, you can reverse it. You can even reverse osteoporosis by bone density. But whether you reverse your bone density completely or not, everything that you do that we've talked about, including calcium and vitamin D, but especially with medicine, reduces fracture risk. I have. Well, that's, that's a hard question. The question is, if you have low bone density, do you, are you on medicine? We used to put all postmenopausal women on medicine when they were, uh, if their bone density was a little bit low, because we didn't want it to get worse. And that is ideal for prevention. But now we're really looking at, that's where FRAX comes in handy. We're looking at what is that person's fracture risk? Should they start uh, an estrogen because they need it for symptoms and prevent bone loss or a designer estrogen in the future? If they start Fosamax or Atelvia, we're not going to want them to be on it 30 years. You know, there will be a period of time, even without data to really prove this, but we care about safety and long-term treatment, where maybe like estrogen, there's a period where after which maybe the risks outweigh the benefits. So I can't just answer that because I don't know your T-score and I don't know your other risks. But we don't treat all women now that have low bone density if they're menopausal. We don't just automatically treat them. I have two questions. First of all, I have good bone density, but except for around my teeth, I have lost bone around my teeth. Good question. Why would that be? Yeah, that is a great question. So. Some of my osteoporotic patients lost their teeth in their 20s or had very, very thin jaw bones. That counts. It doesn't mean that we diagnose you with osteoporosis, but I wish the dentist sent us people earlier that had evidence of bone loss in their jaw because it's systemic. It's likely related. What would be interesting is we need to look at your bone density. Why would your bone density look so good and this not? We need to make sure they did it right and there wasn't some confounder. It makes it harder to know whether to treat you because all the treatment data comes from your hip and spine bone density. But I would worry about your bone quality if your jaw bone is thin. Right. The other question is, my dad ended up with a broken hip and osteoporosis. And he also had a rheumatoid ankylosing spondylitis. Is there any relationship between the two? Yes. So the question is, uh, hip fracture, rheumatoid arthritis, and ankylosing spondylitis association? Yeah. So ankylosing spondylitis, interestingly, decreases mobility, so it increases fracture risk. We don't think that the condition itself thins bone. Marfan syndrome does, so there's other connective tissue conditions that might affect bone quality. The only one that's definitely on the list is rheumatoid arthritis. Any other questions? Okay. Jefferson County has one question. 
Okay, one, one minute, please. Go ahead. Yeah, you, you mentioned uh, you're talking more about estrogen than testosterone, but uh, is it wise to uh, take uh, testosterone uh, uh, pills or supplement or something? Uh, if your levels are low. Yeah, great question. So, How, how do you know if they're low? If, uh, the only way to know if your testosterone is low is to get a blood test. The best time is in the morning. First thing in the morning, that's when testosterone is the highest. It doesn't really matter. Get it checked any time the first time. Total testosterone levels are a good first test because they're less expensive, but they're not always accurate. Just like with thyroid, sometimes you need a free thyroid level. You need a free testosterone level or bioavailable, it's called, and usually the providers know this. So you get a blood test. Just like anything in endocrine, sometimes you have to do things a couple times because hormones are like this some more than others, but if you get a, a testosterone test a couple times and it's low, you know, it, it's, it's usually not subtle, and it absolutely helps your muscles, your balance, your energy, your bone strength, uh, all the other obvious uh, things that it helps. But there are very few risks of testosterone. It's a safer hormone than estrogen, but it does stimulate the prostate. So if a man has a microscopic prostate cancer or has a big prostate, you have to be very careful taking testosterone. Testosterone can't be taken orally because it's bad for your liver. So it has to be by patch, by gel, by shot. There's actually a mint called striant that sticks to your gum that's testosterone. So it's, it's actually a very uh, big field in endocrine, and it's increasing in awareness because of all the symptoms that feel just like hypothyroidism like um, vitamin D deficiency that can make you achy, I didn't even mention that, can make you fall, uh, depression. I mean, testosterone is an important hormone to measure in men. And men with sleep apnea, and it's really fascinating and not quite well understood why sleep apnea lowers testosterone levels, as do pain medicines. So yes. Did we have a question at, a, at the remote sites? Yes, we have a question at Port Townsend. We have nine in attendance. Go ahead. Yes, the question is, um, the New York Times published an article about a study done in Germany in the last couple of years where women over 65 were able to increase bone through intensive exercise increasing over a number of months. Are you familiar with that study? Those studies are hard to put in the real context. Um, there are studies on both sides of the fence for calcium and vitamin D alone, vitamin D by itself, exercise by itself. Um, it's, it's unlikely without medicine in a postmenopausal woman not on estrogen that exercise alone will cause a lot of bone density increases. And there aren't any good fracture studies. Because remember what I started to say in the very beginning, that bone density matters, but what really matters is never fracturing, preventing fractures. So what, before we trust exercise alone, and I'm a big fan of exercise for your bones, we need to make sure that it prevents fractures in addition to making your bones stronger. Thank so I, you. I, 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 unfortunately, I think exercise alone usually isn't enough, but it's definitely worth a try and good to add on to everything else we're doing. Yeah, they measured the bone density. Yeah. It, there are good studies to show. Christine Snow's done a lot of studies. She was at Stanford and moved to Portland with weight vests and jumping. And there's there's a lot there's lots and lots of exercise trials out there that are excellent. And then there's meta analysis where they try to put them all together to answer your exact question. Um, and uh, sometimes it looks great, but in general, it's not enough. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Kohlmeyer. Excellent uh, talk today. Great information. <laughs> Uh, just to remind everybody, uh, just a couple uh, uh, announcements. Dayton has a question. I'm sorry? <laughs> Dayton has a question. Okay, go ahead. Is lactose-free milk as good as regular milk for your calcium and vitamin D? Um, anything that's fortified with vitamin D, you know, even soy milk, if, it, uh, if it's fortified with calcium, look on the, on the carton. It should be fine, even though it's lactose. Thank you. Okay, thanks, everybody. Uh, remember, you can always get the DVD of this program and past programs at the Parkinson's Resource Center by calling 509-473-2490. Uh,
or certainly go to our website at www.spokaneparkinsons.org. Uh, next month's telehealth is Monday, uh, September 12th. The speaker is Tiffany Jensen, uh, a physical therapist from Advantage Physical Therapy, and the subject matter is going to be dizziness and vestibular rehabilitation. Now, one other thing here, again, uh, just to remind everybody, and there are brochures, especially for the folks here in Spokane out front on the desk if you're interested in the um, strides for strong bones. There's brochure out there, uh, and you can also uh, contact them. Uh, there's a phone number in there uh, if you want additional information, et cetera. And there is a deal on there. If five people sign up, it, there's a significant discount, but you have to sign up on the same registration form altogether at once, okay? So such a deal, good for you. So take a look at that. And uh, a lot of good takeaways today. Um, so if you have further questions, uh, certainly always talk to your doctor before you take on something new. And uh, we'll have uh, this information, of course, at the PRC. So uh, take, take care, everybody, and have a safe drive home.